<laughs> All right. And then welcome to the Maven Project's educational session on exercise as medicine, the exercise prescription with Dr. Charles Shulman. Dr. Shulman was an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School from 1988 until 2016. He is currently a corresponding member of the faculty at Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. In addition, he has been practicing non-invasive cardiology since 1970. Dr. Shulman's scientific articles and abstracts have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, Circulation, the American Journal of Cardiology, and the British Heart Journal. His research interests include treatment of hypertension, congestive heart failure, and hyperlipidemia. So Dr. Shulman, you may begin sharing your slides when you're ready. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, actually one of my favorite talks. Uh, I could probably talk about exercise uh, all day long, uh, but I won't. Okay, there you go. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're on. Okay, we're on. Okay. All right. So, um, let's see. Uh, uh, to begin, uh, Hippocrates, a Greek physician in the uh, uh, fifth, fourth century, fifth century uh, BC, wrote, quote, in order to remain healthy, the entire day should be devoted exclusively to ways and means of increasing one's strength and staying healthy. And the best way to do that is through physical, phys physical exercise. In the 12th century, Moses Maimonides, known as uh, Rambam, uh, in his law code, this is a law code, the Mishnah Torah, uh, uh, wrote that uh, one is to, quote, exercise and exert oneself greatly, end of quote. These words of advice are more than a simple admonition. Uh, the Mishnah Torah is a book of laws, not a book of suggestions. <laughs> Therefore, Exercise, according to Maimonides, is a required practice, according to Torah or uh, uh, biblical law. Uh, so starting off with uh, uh, some definitions. Uh, the definition of exercise is any form of physical activity that is planned, structured, repetitive, and purposeful. The main objective of which is the improvement uh, or the maintenance of one or more components of physical fitness. Physical fitness is defined as the ability to carry out daily tasks with vigor and alertness, without undue fatigue, and with ample energy to enjoy leisure time pursuits and meet one's foreseen emergency. Um, physical inactivity, lack of physical activity, um, uh, has uh, uh, implications and uh, worldwide, uh, one out of every five adults is physically inactive. Uh, those numbers are higher in women, in older people, and in lower socioeconomic classes of uh, people. Uh, sedentary behaviors, such as uh, watching TV or sitting in front of a computer all day long, uh, is, as everyone knows, increasing. And uh, physical inactivity is associated with uh, poor health outcomes. There is increased mortality uh, and increased risk for things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Um, so this lady goes to the doctor and she says, doctor, the problem with me is that obesity runs in my family. And the doctor says, no, madam, the problem with you is that no one runs in your family. So, so if we look at the, at the physiology and at the effects of uh, regular dynamic exercise in, on normal hearts, then there are certain morphologic changes that occur uh, with re repetitive uh, and continuous exercise. Um, hearts become larger um, uh, and uh, uh, echoes show uh, an, an average increase in uh, LV mass. Uh, and in parallel to that, uh, coronary artery size increases as well. 
Uh, there are hemodynamic changes, such as uh, lower heart rate. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, systolic blood pressure, a greater cardiac output. Um, uh, VO2 uh, is ox oxygen uptake exercise capacity and coronary reserve, leading to better cardiac function and uh, faster recovery from exercise, including heart rate. In, you know, in addition, uh, I guess it's in addition, uh, endothelial function uh, is protected. Uh, endothelial dysfunction uh, is the first abnormality that eventually leads to coronary artery disease. Uh, it's uh, what our statin drugs uh, uh, treat. Um, this shows uh, what happens with uh, exercise. So um, if we look here, uh, we look here uh, uh, and, and uh, measure uh, workload uh, or oxygen uptake uh, and heart rate then as you increase workload, uh, you increase heart rate in this kind of fashion, normal people. In trained individuals, they start out with a lower heart rate to begin with and rise, the slope of the rise in heart rate is, is lower than the, than the normal. So this is, this is what training does to your heart. Um, there are two kinds of exercise. Uh, aerobic or dynamic exercise, which is repetitive movement of large muscle groups, uh, or anaerobic or static, uh, which is exercise, which is muscle work without movement. If you do this, this, this is anaerobic exercise. The difference is that with, or one difference is that with uh, aerobic or dynamic exercise, heart rate and blood pressure rise slowly, at least until you get the very high levels. On the other hand, with anaerobic or static exercise, blood pressure and heart rate uh, rise very quickly. Um, and uh, uh, that could, uh, so you have, to, you have to do that kind of uh, resistance training. Uh, um, as such, the different sports are, can be classified by uh, dynamic components and static components. So, for example, uh, an exercise with low dynamic component but high static component would be bobsledding, martial arts, uh, weightlifting, uh, whereas a an exercise with high dynamic component and low uh, uh, static component would be badminton, cross-country skiing, uh, race walking, uh, racquetball, long distance running, soccer, because of the, basically because of the running uh, and tennis. And, ex and sports such as boxing and, and uh, cycling and the, the decathlon and rowing uh, uh, are, have high both dynamic and static components. Uh, the physiologic benefits of exercise are, are some of them. I mean, this is not a total list, but uh, a highlighted list uh, include the following. Uh, there's increased myocardial contractility, uh, which leads to increased uh, stroke volume and a higher cardiac output. Uh, there is electrical stability, uh, there is a decrease in heart, uh, uh, heart rate uh, uh, and blood pressure at any given workload. I've illustrated that already. There's improved endothelial function. There's reduced platelet aggregation and increased uh, adrenalysis, um, which is the, the basis for uh, less coronary, not less coronary artery disease, but um, uh, uh, fewer heart attacks or acute myocardial infarction. Uh, there's, there are reduced inflammatory factors such as CRP, and there is improved insulin sensitivity. Uh, any endocrinologist knows that, and uh, so do most of our diabetic patients. Um, uh, energy is measured in, in, in uh, METs, or metabolic equivalents. 
and that is an estimate of the metabolic cost that is oxygen consumption of any physical activity. And one met equals 3.5 mLs of oxygen uptake per kilogram per minute. So I'm sitting here right now, I'm expending one met, uh, as are all of you. Um, moderate physical activity is at least three to six mets, uh, or, uh, uh, well, we'll talk about th that. So walking at three miles, three to four miles an hour and um, uh, is three to four mets. Uh, but if, as you increase the intensity of, of the exercise, the number of mets increases. So that bicycling 10 miles an hour, swimming laps, running at six miles an hour or a 10 minute mile is 10 mets. Uh, <clears throat> Traveling snow for 15 minutes is even more, uh, which is why we ask our patients who have coronary artery disease not to do that. Um, the, the studies of exercise go back uh, to the 1950s. Uh, the, fir the first study of, that was published is the famous uh, London bus driver study. Um, uh, researchers studied the conductors who ran up and down the stairs uh, versus the drivers who sat behind the wheel. And what they saw was the number of coronary occlusions uh, in, in drivers was much higher than that of conductors. Early mortality, early mortality being within three days of an acute MI was high, also higher in drivers than it was in conductors. That, that's that's the first um, population type study, observational study uh, that's been done on exercise. There's been many, many others since then. Um, this, this is uh, 20 year old data showing that uh, exercise that uh, 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 in, in men, as you increase your exercise, you decrease the relative risk of death. And uh, uh, similar, there are similar features uh, for women. Um, uh, this is a study of low risk uh, adults, low risk adults uh, followed uh, for 30 years. So you're looking at 30 year survival. And for what, every one net increase in, in cardiorespiratory fitness, there's an 11% reduction in all cause mortality and an 18% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Um, uh, fitness can also uh, affect your genetic risk. Uh, I took this from the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, to, sli to slash your risk of heart disease, keep moving. Uh, good advice. Um, so this is the this is the biobank uh, data from the UK. Uh, the biobank contains four hundred and sixty eight thousand patients. Uh, of whom 66,000 had, in, uh, had uh, information on, on cardiorespiratory fitness. And what you can see is that as genetic risk increases, so does uh, the hazard ratio of, of uh, cardiovascular disease. But that hazard ratio is influenced by your uh, respiratory, your cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, uh, simply how long you last on the treadmill. Okay, so this is uh, low, uh, medium, and high at different uh, uh, genetic risks. And you can see that it's influenced by uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. Uh, the clinical benefits of exercise are, of course, well known. Uh, but, um, uh, exercise, regular exercise, reduces the risk of dying prematurely, of dying from heart disease, of developing hypertension and diabetes, and of developing colon cancer. It reduces blood pressure, especially in hypertensions, hypertensives. It helps control weight, and it has favorable uh, influence on uh, lipid parameters. It reduces feelings of depression and anxiety. Um, it helps build and maintain healthy bones, muscles, and joints. Exercise does not cause arthritis, uh, especially arthritis of the knee. Uh, it doesn't cause it. Um, you know, it can be 
difficult if you have arthritis of the knee, but it doesn't cause it. It helps elder, older adults become stronger and better able to ambulate, having better balance and uh, better, am, better able to ambulate without falling. It, it, so there's a re reduction in, in falls and fall risk, uh, and it promotes psychological well being. Um, uh, this uh, 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 it's not a chart. This picture um, uh, summarizes some of those some of those same things. Um, now, this is important information that was published uh, three years ago uh, by uh, the Department of Health and Human Services in their physical activity guidelines. And uh, the chart shows um, a hazard ratio of uh, mortality on the uh, y-axis and uh, leisure time act physical activity in, in uh, met hours per week. So, uh, one, you know, one met hour is uh, one met per hour. Um, and what you see, you see uh, there are a number of important um, of, uh, conclusions that can be drawn from this, this data. Uh, uh, generally, the more you do, the, the, the lower your mortality. We've, we've already talked about that. But, uh, you can point out to your patients that there is no lower threshold for benefit. That is, doing something is better than doing nothing. Uh, the curve or the slope of improvement or of uh, benefit is the steepest between no activity and the first uh, levels of activity. And there is no obvious best among uh, amount. Uh, you reach about 70% of benefit uh, if you exercise for eight and a quarter met hours per week. Um, so then, you know, multiply the number of mets by the number of hours that you do it. Um, and uh, that's, you get this met hours. Um, uh, so you get about 70% of that from, from eight, eight met hours. So if you were to exercise, let's say three you know, three three minutes uh, an hour for three hours. That's nine. Uh, so you've met you you have met your goal. The goal uh, you've met this this parameter. The goal is 150 uh, minutes of moderate physical activities per week, uh, 30 minutes five days. And there is no good evidence that there's an increased risk at, at the high end, at, at least in terms of mortality. Uh, although uh, we'll talk about uh, whether you can do too much, okay? Um, walking is, it has the same benefit regarding mortality as running. It just takes longer. So that a uh, uh, five minute run generates the same benefits as a 15 minute walk. And a 25 minute run is equivalent to a 105 minute walk. So as I said, walking is good. It just takes longer than running. Um, cancer patients uh, have been studied um, and uh, uh, their physical health, especially people who have, have recovered from the initial cancer uh, treatment, 60% um, uh, of them live over five years after their diagnosis. Uh, and those people are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease, morbidity, and mortality. Uh, cardiorespiratory fitness is you know, much lower in cancer survivors compared with uh, sedentary individuals without uh, cancer. Um, regular exercise training is uh, safe and effective. Um, to improve uh, uh, peak VO2 max in cancer survivors. Um, and there is consistent evidence from 27 in observational studies showing that physical activity is associated with reduction in all-cause breast cancer-specific and colon cancer-specific mortality. 
Now we've talked about the benefits, let's turn to uh, looking at the risks. The most common uh, risk of exercise is musculoskeletal. Okay, uh, that those risks increase with obesity, with the volume of exercise and with competition. Uh, they decrease with a higher level of fitness level, uh, with supervision of exercise, with proper stretching, with appropriate gear, and with well-designed environments, right? Have you ever tripped on the sidewalk if it was uneven? Uh, you, get, you get the idea. Uh, the key to in injury prevention for most people is gradually increasing uh, either the speed or the duration, but not both at the same time uh, of exercise uh, over time. So if you're, if you're walking for, let's say, a half an hour and you want to increase that to 45 minutes, that's fine at the same rate. Don't increase both the time and the rate of the intensity of exercise uh, at the same time. Um, then there's this exercise paradox, what's called the exercise paradox, because there's a cardiovascular risk. It's been shown that there's a transient risk of acute MI during and immediately after uh, exercise. The, what's been studied is that within about the hour uh, following exercise. Uh, but without heart disease, uh, that translates to one in one event in four to 800,000 hours of exercise. With heart disease, it translates to one event in 62,000 hours. So if you have a, a heart disease, you're at more, you're at higher risk, but you see that the risk isn't very high. And the risk is, is very transient. Uh, regular exercises have a significantly lower risk to begin with all the time, whether they're exercising or not. Um, and it turns out that only five or 10% of acute MIs are associated with vigorous exercise. Um, uh, this uh, is another uh, uh, depiction of the exercise paradox uh, by Dr. Sharma and his colleagues. Uh, uh, these are the benefits, the positive effects of exercise on health that we've already talked about. And these are some of the risks. So that uh, if you have a high lifetime volume of vigorous, intense exercise, there is an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Uh, there is, it's been shown that there's increased coronary artery calcium, and we'll address both of those in, in just a minute. Uh, and there's, there is, there, are, uh, there can be myocardial fibrosis. Um, it's not clear uh, whether that leads to, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say it that way, whether that is, a, is a, an overall risk or not. So if you look at this depiction um, uh, and you look at their risk of atrial fibrillation, then uh, it turns out that at lower levels of exercise, um, exercise actually prevents atrial fibrillation. Uh, this would be a moderate exercise load, and uh, certainly as you uh, uh, as you age, okay. Uh, whereas in young people who are doing extreme exercise uh, over the years, uh, they can develop atrial fibrosis and atrial dilatation and inflammation, and that that promotes uh, atrial fibrillation. In that very small sliver of the top uh, exercises. Um, some of the studies have been done in uh, long distance cross country skiers in the uh, Nordic countries um, uh, where, where exercise, where atrial fibrillation has been studied. Um, can you do too much? Exercise training reduces all major cardiovascular risk factors or cardiac, coronary risk factors, I should say, and it reduces morbidity and mortality from coronary artery disease. Um, well, one of the um, um, uh, markers of coronary artery disease is coronary artery calcium, as seen on a low-dose SD. Um, 
uh, if you have coronary artery calcium, then you have coronary artery disease. It's the only way you can get coronary artery calcium. Um, uh, and it is increased in long-term master's endurance athletes. However, having said that, uh, the, 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 the researchers at the Cooper Clinic in Dallas uh, did a 25-year follow-up of their, their people. Um, I'm not sure I'd call them patients, their people, uh, and noted that there was an attenuation of cardiovascular disease risk at all coronary artery calcium levels with higher fitness. So no matter what your calcium level is, if you have higher fitness, you're better off. Uh, and then Bill Roberts from uh, Minneapolis uh, published a study of 50 men who had completed 3,500 marathons. Uh, and they looked at their coronary artery calcium and found that it was really related to coronary disease risk factors like age and smoking, and not the numbers of marathons or the years of running. Uh, it didn't correlate at all with those. So that brings us to the exercise prescription. What can you recommend for your patient? Uh, the exercise prescription has, has three, um, uh, three, three uh, factors. Frequency, how often? At least three times a week. More is better. Um, intensity. Um, you should be, you should exercise to what you, what, or your patient should exercise to what he or she considers to be, quote, moderately hard or brisk, but comfortable, at least. Um, if you're looking at target heart rate, um, uh, that would be five to 80 percent of the maximum predicted heart rate, which is generally considered to be 220 minus your age. Uh, although yeah, for men anyway, a better predictor might be 208 minus 0.7 times your age. Um, that gives you a little, a little bit higher heart rate. Um, uh, in terms of whether you're doing too much, can you talk in sentences and exercise at the same time? Is, is the so-called talk test. Okay, so that's that's intensity, and then duration should be some something like 30 to 45 minutes but that can be cumulative. So, you know, three times 10 uh, it makes 30. So you can do it that way if you'd like. Uh, appropriate if your uh, warm up and cool down um, uh, should be uh, part of an exercise uh, regimen. Uh, the American College of Sports Medicine uh, recommends uh, the following for healthy Adults, we've already talked about exercise three to five day, days per week, 20 to 60 minutes per session. Um, uh, and uh, they also recommend resistant, uh, resistance exercise two or three days a week. Uh, two to four sets of maybe somewhere between eight and 20 reps, uh, incorporating all, all muscle groups. You want to do four exercises, any uh, trainer will tell you. Um, uh, flexibility uh, is important. I am uh, personally uh, particularly inflexible. Uh, <laughs> and every time I look at uh, one of the young women, you know, bending over backwards and, and uh, I'm jealous because I can't do that. Uh, and then balance training is, is helpful uh, two or three days a week to try to uh, uh, reduce uh, the fall risk. Um, uh, this is heart rate monitoring. I, was, I mentioned this a minute ago. Normally, it's considered to be 220 minus your age, but it's plus or minus 10 beats, uh, the standard deviation. Uh, for men, uh, 208 minus 0.7 times your age. For women, 206 minus 0.88 times your age. Uh, these, may be, these, these may be more accurate. Uh, if you have coronary artery disease on beta blockers, it's going to, you're going to have a much slower pulse rate. The training range is 65 to 80% of maximum uh, heart rate. So that, for example, a 77-year-old man uh, 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 would have the following calculation. 220 minus 77 is 143. 65% uh, of that is 93. So 
but somewhere between 93 and 114 is where his pulse ought to be. If you use this, this other um, uh, calculation, uh, you get a higher heart rate, you say uh, 154, so somewhere between 100 and 123, it's 10 beats, basically 10 beats per minute more. Uh, it's not really necessary to do heart rate monitoring. Uh, if you exercise moderately uh, hard and, and you feel fine doing it, you don't need uh, to measure your pulse, although many people do and, and uh, like to do that. Um, uh, one of the one of the problems I found on the uh, you, when I use the treadmill uh, is that I don't really get an accurate reading. So that I'll put my hands on the on the pulse monitor, uh, and I'll be I don't know twenty minutes at, into into an exercise session, and it'll say my heart rate is sixty seven. Well, no, that's not right. Uh, or it'll say it's 140. That's not right either. Um, uh, more accurate ones uh, put, put me up here somewhere around uh, around some well, somewhere between 115 and 120. Okay. Now there are there are some myths. We should do a little myth busting uh, while we're here, right? You know, patient says, I'm trying to exercise and get healthy. It's pointless uh, because there's a decline in old age and it's inevitable. Well, it's true that decline in old age is inevitable, but not that it's pointless trying to get healthy. Um, exercise isn't safe for someone my age. Well, uh, you know, I don't want to fall and break a hip. I don't want, I'm afraid I might have a heart attack. Well, both of those, in fact, are better if you're, uh, uh, if you have better fitness uh, and you exercise on a regular basis. Uh, I'm too weak to exercise, to start exercising. Well, you're weak because you don't exercise. Uh, and the treatment for that, uh, that deconditioning is exercise, it's the opposite of condition, uh, as I explained to patients. Um, when, an and when an athlete trains, uh, they condition their muscles. When you put somebody in bed, that deconditions their mind. So uh, some of that's that's what's responsible for uh, a lot of that feeling of weakness. Um, again, I say doing nothing is uh, doing something is better than doing nothing. Uh, try to accumulate thirty minutes of moderate intensity exercise most days, uh, but uh, reassure people that everything counts. Um, uh, the 10,000 steps a day is a, is a good goal for people to try to reach. Uh, they, we encourage people to try using a pedometer. <laughs> 10,000 steps a day it has never been scientifically shown to be a parameter of anything. It turns out that that, that number uh, was uh, a marketing tool developed by a Japanese company that made pedometers. They called their pedometer the 10,000 steps a day pedometer. <laughs> That's where it comes from. Uh, but it is a, a reasonable goal for many people to try to achieve. Plan, okay? Make appointments even with yourself to exercise. I have to do that. Uh, I have to decide when I can exercise. Uh, if I, I have things to do in the afternoon, I, I try to find a, a time in the morning if I can't. Do it in the morning, I try to find a time uh, in the afternoon or at noon time. Um, and vigorous exercise uh, is uh, even better. You know, some is better than none. Uh, uh, if you achieve the go guideline levels of exercise, there's a all cause mortality reduction of 30%, uh, which is really significant and, and doesn't cost anything. Um, high dose exercise may or may not be better, but it's certainly not necessarily better. I think you, you need to keep that in mind. Pete, you can't point to you can't point to what can happen if you do too much in order not to do anything. Uh, that's that's uh, that doesn't work. Okay, and so 
try, uh, it's been proposed that we try to uh, integrate physical activity counseling into daily uh, uh, clinical practice. Um, it's been proposed that you make physical activity a vital sign. In other words, ask people if they exercise. Uh, ask them if they do it regularly and what they do. Um, you know, associate physical activity with reduced risk, as we spoke uh, uh, during this during this talk. Um, uh, write a prescription. <laughs> when when we when we wrote prescriptions on paper, <laughs> I would actually do that. <laughs> I take a pre prescription pad out and, and and write a prescription. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, you know, that's a kind of a gimmick, but it, 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 it gets the point across. Um, of course, we don't do paper prescriptions anymore, so that, that doesn't work. Um, uh, you know, encouraging the use of a pedometer or some kind of other record to uh, follow, track your uh, Fitbit, uh, for example, to follow your exercise regimen. And uh, when your patients are successful, and you know, recognize that and encourage uh, reluctant adopters to uh, take up an exercise habit. Now, one question that comes up, that's come up more most recently is whether people can go back to physical activity after they've had COVID nineteen. Um, and uh, this comes from uh, a recent article. Uh, in the Australian Journal of uh, General Practice, um, uh, which I like uh, uh, because it's Australian and because during the pandemic, we've been watching uh, Acorn TV and a number of shows, <laughs> which I never did before, uh, but I like the Australian ones. So what they've done uh, and, the, and the guidelines uh, um, uh, by uh, a group of uh, um, uh, American uh, exercise specialists are, are really quite similar. Um, they divide people into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Uh, low risk patients with COVID-19 might have uh, either mild symptoms or no symptoms and are upper respiratory only, not, not pneumonia. Uh, they would be younger patients, although it could be older patients as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, you want to wait 10 days after a positive test uh, before you start exercising and at least a week uh, without symptoms. Uh, and uh, uh, patients should no longer be taking uh, 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 fever reduction uh, medications uh, such as in Australia, paracetamol. Uh, actually, that's in Canada too, uh, or, or Tylenol in uh, the United States. It, it, I mean, um, acetaminophen. Um, uh, and then have people gradually return to their physical activity. Okay. Uh, gradually return to normal routines and weight. You know, if you haven't been exercising for two weeks or so, uh, don't, don't start out right where you were before. Start out at half. Uh, and see how that works out. And then gradually raise the uh, raise the uh, uh, exercise uh, 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 regimen. Now, for intermediate pa risk patients, uh, uh, people who've had symptoms for more than a week, people who've had uh, um, dyspnea or chest pain with their illness, or they've had pneumonia, uh, uh, elite exercise, you know, uh, or endurance athletes, uh, or they are people with a history of uh, pulmonary problems, uh, you would want to do at least some basic testing, uh, ECG, uh, blood tests, uh, a chest, possibly a chest x-ray, uh, depending on uh, how they are and what you find, perhaps a cardiac echo. If, there's, if this is all normal, they, can, they should gradually return to physical activity. Uh, if it's abnormal, then they, that become, that makes it a uh, high risk. Uh, and, uh, uh, at least, uh, the possibility of myocarditis is raised. You know, the high risk patient would be a patient who's been hospitalized or in the ICU or who has ab an abnormal electrocardiogram or cardiac markers, um, uh, or has a history of cardiac disease and patients like that should be tested, uh, 
uh, following their hospitalization uh, with ECG, troponin, BNP, chest X-ray, and uh, possibly an echocardiogram. Um, uh, possibly, they, you know, uh, not too many people will need a stress test. Um, and those people have to be further assessed um, uh, in order to determine whether there's whether it, they have continuing uh, diff, uh, evidence of disease, in which case um, uh, they, they, the uh, diagnosis of myocarditis comes up. They're normal, and they're they're then cleared, and they can resume. And then uh, there are red flag symptoms. Um, uh, which, if uh, if helps them, uh, should prompt a reevaluation, such as chest pain or palpitations, breathlessness out of proportion to the expected um, uh, exercise and recovery, and any features of thrombosis, uh, swollen calf, sinus tachycardia, or breathlessness. So that's that's the warning uh, sign that that we need to pay attention to. Uh, you know, uh, that, that, because, that places a patient in a high risk category. And if they're having such, such symptoms, you have to evaluate them for myocarditis. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of pay, uh, people will, be, will have mild illness and will be able to resume exercise. There was just a publication uh, from the uh, NCAA of um, several thousand, I don't remember the number, uh, several thousand uh, athletes, and they found that there was only a 2% uh, incidence of uh, uh, problems uh, following uh, recovery from COVID. So most of those, you know, the, so the other 98% can go in room. Okay, and so finally, uh, we offer you this comment by the doctor. Uh, what fits into your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? And with that, I say thank you very much and I'll take any questions. Can I ask a question? Sure, of course you can. Wait a minute. Okay. Wait a minute. I'm wondering uh, whether exercise, the effect of exercise on asthma and whether, and what types of exercise would be good or bad for someone with asthma? Uh, uh, I would say uh, that the exercise that they can do without, without having difficulty. That is, that is to say, I don't think there's a specific exercise to recommend. Um, and uh, one thing that seems to help people with asthma is uh, uh, having uh, using their inhaler prior to the exercise uh, session. Um, um, you know, slow, gradual increase so that you know uh, a person with asthma who wants to do aerobic exercise might want to have a longer um, warm-up period. Uh, exercising in the cold seems to stimulate uh, 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 wheezing uh, in, in some of these susceptible individuals. Uh, and, and that would be a side benefit of wearing a mask <laughs> because it <laughs> heats up the uh, inhaled air uh, that you have. Um, there's a question in the chat. What are your thoughts about people with spinal cord injuries and varying levels of paralysis and exercise? Uh, uh, my, 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 my recommendation is, is a practical one. They should try to do what they can do. Uh, depends on the level of spinal cord injury. Uh, we certainly know uh, um, athletes um, who've had uh, lower spinal cord injuries so that they don't have the use of their leg. They exercise, they exercise from a wheelchair. Uh, they, run, they, run, they run, quote, run the Boston Marathon. We had, there's a wheelchair division uh, that we see, you know, we see the participants here when we watch the Boston Marathon. Uh, 
uh, so so but but basically it's what it, it you try to use the muscles that you have um there are for example if you want to do aerobic exercise and don't have the use of your legs there are uh, bicycle mechanisms that that you can use uh, 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 handheld handheld uh, uh, bicycle uh, apparatus. Dr. Shulman, why do you think that's impractical? I think those are great suggestions. There's so many opportunities for people with spinal cord injuries to exercise. No, I didn't they say it was impractical. I said you should be. It should be practical. Ah, excellent, excellent. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, okay. Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. As I say, we see, you know, there are, I mean, look at the Paralympics. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, people are encouraged to do whatever they can do. Um, you know, studies show that a lot of physicians don't encourage exercise for people with disabilities, and it, it sh I think it's it's something that's missing, and maybe that's because of an, in, you know, a bias about people with disabilities, so. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know what the reason is, but you're right. I think that they, that, that people are, would be missing something. Those people should be, would, would be missing something. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your great talk. I just have. Yes. Dr. Bishops, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Thank yes, you for your great. Thank you for your great talk. I just have a quick question. Um, a lot of our patients and us too are very busy. Um, what do you think about if, for example, like if the patient cannot do three times a week, but maybe 90 minutes on the weekend instead, is that like a, you know, pretty much like similar effect or would you say slightly less or how can we, you know, counsel them in that regard? You bring up an interesting point because that's the so-called weekend warrior uh, 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 syndrome, if you want to, I, it's not a syndrome, but it, it's the weekend warrior concept, I'd say. I once had a patient, I don't know how he did it. He ran 12 miles one day a week. You know, I don't know how he did it because I think you, you I, I, I certainly don't recommend that. You know, if people can only exercise on the weekend, they should exercise on the weekend. It's better than not exercising at all. Yeah, no, that's for sure. So you think that that patient you had, it was equivalent to somebody going like four miles Three times a week. Is there any uh, studies that I, you know of? Or uh, I, the study that I'm I'm referring to, I think the weekend warriors uh, had less benefit than than for uh, uh, equivalent times uh, spread out through the week. It, it was less, but it was certainly more than not not actually. Yeah, no. So it seems like it's best to go for it. So that's maybe something I can, <laughs> I can try yeah, well, for our I, patients. I, I encourage people, to, whatever they can do, they, you know, is better than what they don't do. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of as simple as that. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Pleasure. Get out, get out and run. How many, how many of you exercise? Raise your hand. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Of course, I can't see all the people who don't have their, their don't have their videos on. But I'll take it that you're you're raising your hand, <laughs> uh, Doctor Shulman. Oh, oh, yes. sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I had great talk. Thank you so much. This is Doctor Anderson from FIU. I had a question. We're hearing a lot in the marketing about how sitting is the new smoking. And that I guess you hear a lot of marketing about getting people to just at least stand or use standing desks. Is there cardiovascular evidence of benefit of standing as opposed to sitting? Uh, or is that essentially not there and it's just marketing that's being pushed our way? Um, I, I'm not, I don't know the data. Um, I think that I, I, don't, I don't know it. I can try to find it, but I don't know it. Um, uh, I think it's, I think it's better to stand than it is to sit. Uh, intuitively, I would say it's better to stand than, than it is to sit, but what, you know, but you know, how much of that I, uh, in a way I agree with you. I don't know how much of that is marketing. 
<laughs> the people who are in marketing. <laughs> Stand up. That's it. That's it. You, you, uh, Fred, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can um, uh, find that or find anything on that. If I can, I'll let you know. There are two questions in the chat. Um, we'll start with the first one. What guidance do you give to a teenager diagnosed with marifinoid habitus, a skeletal dysplasia with cardiac improvement? In, sorry, involvement. I, I'm sorry, I don't understand what the, in the chat. Uh, it's in the chat. Where yeah. where would that be? Um, so right next to the share screen button, there's the no, no, chat. No, I'm in the chat. I, I'm trying to find the question. Oh, it's from Dr. Defendi. Uh, uh, oh, 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 a, 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 a teenager diagnosed with morphinoid and skeletal dysplasia. I would say, um, be careful, <laughs> would be my two word, uh, my two word advice. You know, can such a person exercise? I think so. Um, uh, if, if the person has, uh, uh, um, uh, such, a, such a person can improve, improve their, their fitness level, I think. Uh, just have to do it uh, perhaps more gingerly than uh, than uh, the, another person who doesn't have that problem. Great. And then, do you have an opinion regarding the benefit of high intensity interval training? Uh, the benefit of high intensity interval training is good if you're training. You know, if you have a if you have a goal to uh, yeah, you know, I, I, well, I, I mean, you know, elite actors, elite athletes use interval training all the time. And it, uh, what I know about it is that it is beneficial. You know, for recreational exercises, exercisers like me, uh, it's not really necessary unless I, unless I have a goal to increase, you know, increase what I do. Um, but you can do that with that, you know. So it, it, that's a, it's a training technique and it is successful and it, it's not necessarily harmful uh, if it's done properly. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? Um, uh, all right, somebody had a, uh, a comment. Let me see, patients with diabetes can get maximum health benefit by dividing their 30 minutes of daily exercise into three 10 minute sessions done within the first hour after each meal. This improves postgrandial uh, hyperglycemia. Yes it, does. yes, it does in lower A1C. Um, uh, I'm always a little cautious about exercising right after a meal, doing vigorous exercise right after a meal. Um, walking exercise is fine. Uh, you know, lower intensity exercise is fine, uh, but not high intensity exercise. You know, my mother, my mother always said, right, we lived, I, I grew up in New Jersey, near the New Jersey shore. And so, of course, the kids, you know, my, the families, uh, the kids would go to the, go to the beach. And my mother always said, don't go in the water right after you eat because you're going to get a cramp. <laughs> right? That's what my mother said. Now, that was a long time ago. It, that has, I think, some physiologic basis. Um, you know, right after you eat, there's a, your, your, um, Parasympathetic nervous system shunt blood to the gut and away from my working muscles. So that's why you would get a cramp. Um, so uh, I would I would just be careful about that, as opposed to doing intense uh, exercise at, that, at those times. But it's right. Uh, the, the, uh, I don't know who the comment who made the comment, but 
uh, it's right that that will help uh, people um, uh, lower their uh, postprandial uh, blood sugar and uh, lower their A1C. Uh, that was my comment, uh, endocrinology here. Uh, okay. The reasons that I was trying to uh, get to do this were in no way uh, elite athletes or intensive exercises at all. I was just trying to get them to do anything. <laughs> well, so they were usually the overweight type two diabetes, which is most of what people are going to see in primary care. So this was uh, kind of a an attempt to entice them to start moving. And um, in the years when I worked in the high risk OB clinic, uh, we used to use this um, as a tool to help Im help tighten up the control for our pregnant diabetics. Obviously, they are not doing a whole lot of anything uh, very vigorous or intense, especially when they're in the third trimester. And it was very effective. Yeah, I, oh, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. But it's doing something as opposed to doing nothing. Right, right. right? As, opposed, as opposed to high intensity exercise. Right. I also figured most of them weren't if they did exercise, 10 minutes wasn't enough. You know, if they were that serious into the exercise, 10 minutes isn't enough time for someone who's got that kind of uh, training and mindset. That's like, well, you know. well yeah, and again, 10 minutes is better than nothing. <laughs> so, okay, there you go, Erin. Thank you so much. This was great. Uh, okay. Thank There's you, everybody. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.